follow along, you can go to rmfchurch.org, click on media, then notes. And um, if somebody can give me a signal when I'm done to make sure I pray over everybody in the offering, because that's not part of my routine, so I'll, I'll forget that. But uh, Romans 15, 13. Now may God, the inspiration and fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with hope. Amen. Let me pray before we begin today. Father, I just pray for our hearts to be open, our minds to be receptive, and the Holy Ghost to minister life to each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Church for Real is what the title of today's message is. And um, I just want to share some things. I didn't say much last week about what's going on on our planet, especially in America. But um, I've done a lot of praying and a lot of thinking and a lot of meditating. And I believe the Lord's been speaking to me about some things that... um, I feel like can help us as a church and for those who are watching to help everybody. And uh, I, I know this. There's, if you've been, we've been married 31 years this last month. And uh, 31 years. And in 31 years, you know, your marriage ebbs and flows, ups and downs. If you've been married more than six months, you understand what I'm saying probably. But... Um, <laughs> But you know when my marriage and relationship with Melody has gone to a higher level and a better level is when I try to understand her. When I, when she, very seldom, but when she does something to get under my skin, I'll let you be the the definition of very seldom. But anyway... um, when I try to be defensive toward that or explain myself or just look at Mike, it never turns out good. And, but when I try to understand her, where she's coming from, love automatically comes out of me. So the Lord said that uh, that to me as far as the whole racism that's going on and this whole, just this stuff that's going on. And um, I realize in Pueblo, there's only 2% of black people in our city. Only 2%. So you think, well, why address it here? It's only 2%. Uh, I have this funny thing that I do with Danielle. It's not really funny. It's funny to me. But she, she leaves our kid, her kids. I guess they're my kids too, grandkids. But um, she's piling them in the car, and you know, she says, "Okay, have a, you got everybody?" She goes, "Oh no, I'm still missing one." And I usually go, "Oh, two out of three. That's not bad." But uh, you know, so I was thinking this week uh, about that funny thing, and how I felt like God spoke to me about something. Uh, about his kids. You know, if you got three or four kids, let's just say you got six kids. First of all, Jesus help you. But anyway, if you got six kids, (laughs) and one of them is mistreated in school, one of the six, a parent's not going to say, well, at least five were treated right. Am I telling the truth? No, you're, as a parent, you're going to come unglued. And you're going to say, I don't care if it is just one. It matters. And so um, the Lord said to my heart that that's the way it is with me, Mike. If one of my kids is mistreated, it breaks my heart. And so I really want to share my heart with you this morning, and I just pray that you will be open. 
There's been times when I feel like, well, you know, I understand about uh, racism. I, I feel, you know, I was a missionary in Africa, which means absolutely nothing when it comes to how the blacks are treated in our nation. I will never understand what a black man goes through. And if you're white, neither will you. And I just felt like the Lord has been ministering to me. And Melody got a book, and I've been listening to it. It's called The Myth of Equality. I'm only read, I've been listening to it. It's three chapters. And the rest of it may be horrible, but those first three chapters just slapped me upside the head. I encourage you to get it, at least if the last part, don't judge me on it. But the first part, it's the myth of equality by Ken Weitzma, W-Y-T-S-M-A. How do you say that? Witzma? And anyway, he's, uh, he writes it from a Christian perspective. And uh, he said something in this book. It was just a simple illustration, but it just slapped me. There was this white guy, and he said, um, well, I've worked hard all of my life. Nobody's given me nothing, so I don't have a white privilege. I've worked hard. I've struggled. And this guy who wrote the book, he sit there, and he says, so what do you do? He says, I do um, landscaping. He says, I'm very successful at it. He says, what do you do your landscaping? And he says, you know, in the suburbs. And he says, is it generally a white area? He goes, yeah. He says, do you do it when they're at work, the house is vacant? He says, yeah. He says, a lot of times I do that. You know, they trust me to do that. He says, what do you think if you were black, would you get the same amount of business and be as welcomed in those white suburbs? And he was honest, and he said, probably not. He said, that's what white privilege is. And I know... The majority of our town is, well, Hispanic, I think it was 50-something percent whites, 40-something black, 2 percent, and people from Kentucky, 0.01 percent. But anyway, I know that um, I started, I'm a history guy, I like history, and there's some things that I've never known about the history of America, never been taught. And again, I just believe that if we can understand people, it will open up the love of God in your heart and my heart. And the Lord says, just like it does for your marriage, it's like that with all people. When you start trying to understand people that are different from you, By the way, that would be just about everybody. (laughs) When you start trying, instead of judging, instead of, um, well, they're so different, they're, why do they, and let me just say this, this rioting and everything that's going on, of course we don't agree with that, but I do believe it's what the devil wants to get our eyes off of trying to make things better. Because, you know, people say, yeah, but, you know, at least it's, it's not as bad as it used to be. Well, like I said, if it's just one person, it's not acceptable. I listen to this, you know, I, I believe he, he knows what he's talking about. And I, I Googled it and found out backing him up. But he said um, there's a time in history... I didn't write down the dates. It's either in the late 1700s to the mid-1800s or right after that, that uh, to be a citizen of the United States, you had to prove that you were white. I never knew that. I had to prove that you were white. And if you owned land, you had only could be a citizen to own land. So guess who were the landowners? White people. Only white people could own land. 
I never knew that existed in our history. And then after the Civil War, when uh, the blacks started getting some privileges, they still made, a, made black people jump through hoops by saying that you could only vote if you took a literacy test. White people did not have to take a literacy test, but black people did. So guess what happened? Black people didn't get to vote. The black people started catching on. They started reading, learning to read, so they could vote. I'm just saying that I'm not saying this to shame our history, but I am saying that there are some things that white people need to understand. I know I do. Let me just say this. There's some things that Mike Davis needs to understand. Because I do know that God wants us to love everybody because for God so loved the world. And we are all created in his image. Red and yellow, black and white. We sang that when we were a kid and then when we grew up we were taught something different. Barna Research, which is a Christian research institution, Barna, said that only 50% of Christians believe that people of color are put at a disadvantage lower than the national average of 67%. I don't know about you, but I, that's a problem for me to think that the church... think there's really not an issue or a problem. But the world sees that there is. Something's wrong with that picture. Barna Research, who did this research, Brooke Hemphild said, white Christians demonstrate a blindness to the struggles of their African-American brothers and sisters and a dangerous reality to the modern church. In this book, The Myth of Equality, it says racism is worse than we thought. Its lasting consequences are more significant than we think. Our responsibility is greater than what we've been taught. You know, to me, it's never been a big deal because, I mean, I love black people. I love Hispanic people. I love people. I just love people. So I think it's really not that big a deal. Because I love people. And so I don't address it a lot because I just think, what's going on? But I just felt strong this week that the Lord says, even though, I said, Lord, there's only 2% of black people here. You mean, what kind of pebble are we going to make in, in the pond? But you know, God never looks at things like that. He looks at the one, the woman at the well. Samaritans and Jews, there was racism back then. It's been around for a long time. Jews were not allowed to associate with Samaritans. They looked down upon them. And then even women were at the bottom rung. They're, they were at, under the barrel. They weren't at the bottom of the barrel. They were under the barrel. And here's Jesus there was a Samaritan woman, and he approaches her and starts talking to her. And, he's, and she's shocked, like, hello, I'm a Samaritan, and I'm a woman. And yet he's talking to her. But he's not just talking to her. He's ministering the love of God to her. You know, when people said, you know, again, you look through things through filters. You read through things through filters. You know, they, uh, Jesus says, go get your husband. And she says, you know, well, I'm not married. She says, yeah, that's right, you've had five husbands. And everybody would automatically read that. And I was raised up to think that woman, yeah, I know what you prostitute, loosey-goosey type woman, you. I know what you are. But you don't understand the culture that women were never allowed to divorce because they were on the bottom of the ring. Men were the only ones that could divorce. So she was rejected five times. She was rejected five times. Had nothing to do with what type of woman she was. And Jesus realized that she was embraced 
by rejection. I believe that's why this happened at that time because God, listen to me now, God never wants anybody to feel rejected. Especially because of your skin, color, your race, your culture, or what country you're from. John 17, 21. Jesus said this. Evidently, he knew we were going to have a problem. He says, I pray for them all to be joined together as one. Even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. Jesus is praying for the world. And this is his prayer now. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. He says, I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. The world is looking for an answer. And Jesus said the answer is... Unity and love will cause the world to know that Jesus was sent to this planet. Wow. There will be racism and division until Jesus comes. I know that. But I do know this. If the Spirit of God can use me and use you to change one person, it was well worth it. For a Saul to become a Paul. And that guy changed the world. He thought he was doing right and justice by putting Christians in jail and killing them. In verse 23, it goes on to say, For the very glory you have given to me, I have given them, so that they will be joined together. In other words, there is something in humanity that God has given to cause us to walk together in unity. For this very glory you have given to me, I have given to them, so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. Could you imagine experiencing the unity that Jesus and the Father God experiencing that what is that I, I don't know but I, I want to be part of that don't you it says you have lived fully in me and now I live fully in them so that they will experience perfect unity and the world will be convinced that you have sent me for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. Again, you know, I just feel like to reiterate this. You know, you can say, well, what about this and what about that? And, and how about, you know, how about this white cop? He was killed and nobody's making. I understand. I'm not trying to belittle any of that. And I think we should uphold the, and honor our police force. But let's just be real. There's, there's bad cops. There's bad pastors. There's bad politicians. There's bad doctors. There's bad parents. You name it, and there's going to be a person who's bad in that field and who does not do right. Dear Lord, there's been so many bad politicians. If we just wanted to get rid of that, we should have did that long time ago. But we keep the politicians and we keep voting. I just felt like, you know, I've, and I've seen this. People who I love and honor, they'll raise up, well, what about this? I understand that, but let's not lose focus of what we should be focusing on right now. That's the thing. It's just like, it's the devil, man, I can see him working. And I just think, you talking about sneaky. You know, to, to cause people uh, and all this rioting, looting, and killing is going on. And so all of a sudden, this issue is dropping down by the wayside, and this is taken in the forefront. It's just a tool of the devil. Well, I believe that the church has a responsibility to spearhead this with the love of God. 
Love never fails. Never fades out, becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. Love. So, these three simple things, this is what I feel like in my heart. The first one, of course, we pray. And the second one, especially if you're a white person, you need to have a dialogue with somebody who's black. More than one. Because I've tried to talk to all the black people in our church, and they all have a different perspective. They all feel differently. Some of them, it's just like, wow, I'm sorry that you are going through this and feel this way. And other ones are like, oh, man, I tell you what, no, it's just like nothing, you know. But if we are going to understand, you can't just talk to white people. I'm being where the rubber meets the road. You can't just get an opinion of a white person to try to understand this. I'm sorry, but you can't. You know, and I just don't get it, to be honest with you. Uh, I think it's inbred in our nation and around the world that because racism is not a color issue. Because when we are in Africa, 250,000 people of a tribe... Was it the Hutus or the, the Hutus were killed or the Watusi? Hutus, I get 250, and it was black on black. So it wasn't a color issue. It wasn't that. It was just a hate issue. You are a different tribe from us, therefore we're going to kill you. 250,000 people were massacred. Black on black. So it's not a, you know... A color is why, why did you know? I just I think even from the very beginning, and I know they did it for statistics, but you know, like you fill out certain forms, or are you Caucasian, or are you white, or white? See, I'm from Kentucky, and I thought Caucasian, what color? I'm not, I'm not Caucasian, but anyway, uh, <laughs> are you Caucasian, or black, or Hispanic, or Indian? Right there, it. it it's, it shows there's a separation. It should be on there. Are you breathing? You're a ch- you are created in the image of your father. No matter if you're an Indian, Hispanic, or black, Russian, Chinese, you're created in the very image of God. It is strange. I mean, it could have been, we could have had separation of hair color. What color is your hair? Brown. I would have been minority. Reds or redheads are minority. I would have been minority. But this is what the Lord, I felt like the Lord says that I don't this, I can miss it, okay? I can miss God. But I feel like the Lord says I don't even like the word minority. Because I don't see a minority on my planet. Because they're all my kids. And don't get me wrong, I know if people, I'm not trying to be, I don't know what I'm trying to be. But anyway, I, I just felt like, you know, to think that you are a minority, which means that there's more, there's less of you. No. If you're black, if you're Hispanic, if you're whatever, don't, don't think there's less of you. Anyway, pray, have a conversation uh, with people that are black because the ultimate answer for rejection and hate is Jesus and his love and number three believe and agree with that prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 21 that we may be one agree with that prayer being part of the answer to the prayer of Jesus that's what I want Rocky Mountain Family Church I want us to be part of that answer to that prayer I really do and if you are white, I hope that you don't get offended over this. I hope that you hear my heart. Because I believe the heart of God. And John 13, 35 says this. For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers.
I pray that we're known for one thing. Not that we're perfect, but that is a church of love. If that's our testimony, we have succeeded. We may not cross every T and dot every I when it comes to doctrine. We may not cross every T and dot every I when it comes to doing everything right. And I can be offensive at times. I can stick my mouth, my foot in my mouth. Or I could bend down and stick my mouth in my foot. I'm pretty good at both. But this is what I'm praying for our church. There's an African proverb. How ironic. I found this. An African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, we can do this all alone. But if you want to go far, we have to do this together. Parents, I encourage you to teach your kids... Danielle had a great conversation with her kids about racism. We need to teach our kids about this. We do. I didn't say anything to my kids growing up about racism, but I did do one thing. They saw me loving black people, Hispanic people. They saw me hugging every kind of people and loving them. So we do need to have honest conversations. You can't just assume, well, they're black, but they're a Christian. They know. No. And that's why 56% of the church believes that there's no problem. There is a problem, Houston. There is. But I am thankful. I'm 61 years old today. 61. And it's never been blown up in my face until now. I, that's a disgraceful thing. I'm sorry. But I do know one thing. These last years of my life, I can make a difference by causing people's eyes to be opened up. To see things that, and to un- try to understand things that we have not. And listen, I don't have all the answers, but I have found out one thing as a pastor. You know, I go to funerals. I I go to people that are getting ready to die. And a lot of times, I don't have the answer. But you know what I do? I show up and just let my presence and my love be there. I'm not telling you we have to have an answer. But I am saying this. We should be a people that says, I am there for you. And my love is there for you. Amen? Let's stand. I'll be available. Melody and I will be available outside if you need personal prayer. The ushers, if you could dismiss from the back to the front. You know, the governor came out with all these regulations, and we are trying to abide by them. Just because we don't want to get fined. <laughs> Take that off the tape. What do you want me to do? Oh, go up on there. Oh, thank you, Josh. I need to learn my sign language. He went. I'm going to pray for you. I'm thankful for our church. Thankful for you. Thank you for listening to me. Listen. Let's understand every race, every person. When you start understanding people, I, the Lord just showed me that this week. He says, when you understand Melody, does it take much effort for you to have love just gush out of you? I go, no, it doesn't. He goes, ding, 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 ding. When you start trying to understand people, you'll start seeing things from a different perspective. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. For souls to be healed today. Emotions and feelings to be touched that only you can. That no one should feel rejection. And I pray if anybody has felt that, no matter what color their skin, I just pray 
for the healing balm of Gilead, the, that special healing power to heal people today, to know that they are loved by God, that they are not a minority, they're not an outcast, they're not somebody that's so different, they are created in your image, God. And so I pray for rejection to be healed, for feelings and emotions and of every soul to be healed. I pray, Lord, that when I just believe that bodies are going to be healed, I pray for this message of love to go out and cause healing to happen in physical bodies, for minds to be healed. No guilt, no bitterness. For anybody who says, I was mistreated, I was done wrong, for that bitterness that people are hanging on to, I pray for it to be healed in Jesus' name. The God who heals all is present to heal us today. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you for the giving, every need met in an abundant way, that we have more than enough. Thank you for being a blessing to us and for us in Jesus' name. Amen.